transported him to the hospital, and at this hour, he is inside Bellevue Hospital in a specialized isolation ward. We heard from New York Mayor Bill de Blasio just minutes ago, who said his city is ready. We have the finest public health system, not only anywhere in this country, but anywhere in the world. It's a public health system that has been developed over decades. It is ready for extraordinary challenges, and it's proving it as we speak. We are fully prepared to handle Ebola. And here's what we have learned about Dr. Spencer's movements. We know he took the subway the night before he fell ill. And he took that subway to a bowling alley in Brooklyn called Gutter. That business has now voluntarily closed for sanitation. And health officials are stressing that the danger to the public is very low because he was not symptomatic. From New York to Maryland, we learned today that the first person to be infected with Ebola here in the U.S., that was nurse Nina Fahm, she is now Ebola-free. And she will meet with the president this hour at the White House. She spoke today from the NIH facility in Baltimore. Throughout this ordeal, I have put my trust in God and my medical team. I am on my way back to recovery, even as I reflect on how many others have not been so fortunate. And we have just learned, as I just mentioned, that Fahm will be at the White House this hour. She's set to meet with President Obama. But let's start in New York at Manhattan's Bellevue Hospital with NBC's Kristen Dahlgren. And Kristen, what do we know this hour about Dr. Spencer's condition? Hi there, Crystal. Well, we just got confirmation from the CDC that the test it ran confirms that Dr. Spencer does have Ebola, but we heard from New York City health officials, and they say that today he is in stable condition. He's being quarantined here at Bellevue Hospital, as is his fiance, who came in close contact with him. Two other friends of Dr. Spencer's have also been isolated. The three, uh, the fiance and the two friends, not showing any symptoms at all, but are expected to stay in isolation for the full 21-day uh, incubation period. It's not believed that Dr. Spencer was symptomatic for very long at all. He was self-monitoring, and they say as soon as he noted, noticed an elevated temperature, he called authorities, Crystal. And Kristen, I know you've been speaking with folks there at Bellevue. Are they confident they can handle this case? You know what they are. Uh, I spoke with uh, d at least one doctor this morning who works here. He said things have changed a little bit. They've been told to stay in their units. He was a doctor uh, in a psych ward, and he said they've really been told to stick to their areas. Only very essential personnel allowed into the quarantine unit, and only the ones that are absolutely necessary are treating and coming in close contact with Dr. Spencer. Here's a little bit more about what he told me. Is Bellevue prepared? Yeah, I think so. That's actually one of the things I took pride in. I have mixed feelings about this. I'm pretty sad that, you know, Ebola is in New York City and it affected this gentleman that tried to help people across seas. But I do feel pride in working at a hospital that is ready for this and can handle anything that comes to its doors. So obviously the CDC and hospitals around the country have been watching the Nina Pham and Amber Vincent cases very closely. Nurses there infected as they were treating an Ebola patient. Nobody wants that to happen again. So they are making uh, very clear here that they need to obey any type of protection and protocol. And so far they tell me they're doing that. All right, that's great to hear. NBC's Kristen Dahlgren, thank you so much for that report. And joining me now here on set, we have New York City Councilman Mark Levine. He represents the district where Dr. Spencer lives. And we also have Dr. Devi Numpia Parampal. She's of the NYU School of Medicine. Thank you both so much for being with us today. I really appreciate it. So, Councilman, I know you were this morning at Dr. Spencer's apartment building. You spoke to folks around there. Are people concerned? What's kind of the mood in the neighborhood? They're concerned. If anything, they might be a little bit too scared. There's so much misinformation out there. People don't understand that Ebola is actually very difficult to contract. And we've got to get that message out. There have been street teams of outreach workers from the city's Department of Health really since the moment this crisis began, giving out bilingual literature. Uh, we need more of that, certainly, in the days ahead. This is a largely immigrant neighborhood. A few medical workers, like Dr. Spencer, who 
work in the nearby hospital, but we've got to get this information out bilingually through the Spanish media so that people understand if you didn't have intimate contact with Dr. Spencer, you're likely not at risk. You're going to be fine. And, and what is actually going on at the apartment building today? Has the cleanup process started? What is happening in that building? Well, there's been quite a media circus there since I can the imagine. moment this began. The apartment itself has been sealed up since the moment that Dr. Spencer left. No one's been in, no city officials, no security. Um, we're expecting any moment now, perhaps it's already underway, that a uh, specialized cleanup team will get there. This is a contractor hired by the city, uh, environmental experts. They go in with the full protective garb, all the equipment they need, and they'll be removing body fluids they see in the apartment and any uh, materials such as sheets or towels or toothbrushes. And they have the proper procedures in they place do. to handle that material appropriately. And they, they remove it. It doesn't go into the trash stream. Uh, it's removed in a very specialized way so that if... When Dr. Spencer gets better, let's be hopeful, he could return to the apartment safely. Great. And Dr. Debbie, we were initially hearing that Dr. Spencer reported 103 degree fever. We got new information. It was actually 100.3 degrees. Does that change your assessment of the situation as a medical professional? Not totally, because he's still having symptoms. He's still having a fever, and we know that he has Ebola. But, of course, in terms of how vigorous of a response it is, the 103 is much more concerning because it means your immune system is really fighting. You know, it's uh, waging a serious battle against the virus. So I think before he had the fever, of course, you know, it's very low risk for anybody to contract Ebola. So I agree. I don't think the public should be worried. That's very good to hear. And, and Councilman, you know, we've heard that Bellevue Hospital is, has taken precautions in advance of, uh, in anticipation that there could be an Ebola patient sent there. Are they more prepared, do you think, than Texas Health Presbyterian was? Well, New York City's public health system is arguably the best in the world under any circumstances. But with the case in Texas, the health officials here have reviewed all procedures from top to bottom. They've redoubled training efforts. There have been daily drills. Really, the city could not have been more prepared for this. And this was exactly the kind of incident that teams had drilled for. And because of that preparation, really, I think it's been executed flawlessly until now. Mm. Dr. Javi, do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, so just to talk a little bit more about the training, I mean, in the city, people are doing a lot of different things. So they're having mock patients or fake patients come in, you know, theoretically with Ebola to see how they manage that. And then they're having kind of feedback sessions every week about that to make sure that the teams get better. And a lot of hospitals also have special sort of strike teams, kind of like the one the Pentagon formed, where these are people, let's say laboratory technicians, doctors, nurses, everybody who might come in contact with bodily fluids who come in as soon as there's an Ebola patient. So I think doing all of these things, especially having done them for several months before this actually happened, should inspire a little bit more confidence. Yeah. Doctor, I wanted to ask you about what's, what's been raised. It's a little bit of a sensitive issue. Yeah. Is is there a case to be made for quarantining medical profession, professionals and soldiers who return from these affected countries in West Africa? Well, it's a difficult issue, but I think, you know, if we do that, we have to do it consistently, right? So uh, if we say that anybody coming back from West Africa has to be quarantined, then the troops should be included in that as well. And if we do that, we should do other things to make it a little bit easier for them to maintain the quarantine. So why not have quarantine strike teams as well, you know, who bring them food, take care of their other errands? Because those are the reasons why people find it difficult to be in quarantine, right? Or at least, you know, have them have some limited contact with other people, but maybe more supervised and very clear guidelines about what needs to be done. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, the number one priority needs to be fighting this epidemic of course. in those countries. And if you have doctors who have to go over and then be quarantined for 21 days, yeah. that's going to impact our ability to respond there. But Councilman, on, on a personal level, you know, when did you hear about, about the fact that Dr. Spencer was infected with Ebola? And what have you said to your friends, loved ones, people in your family about the risk and what they should be thinking about? Well, I got the call from the mayor's office uh, maybe about 2.30 yesterday, and uh, disbelief was my reaction. How could it be that of all the places on earth, uh, Ebola has struck right in my council district on 147th Street? Uh, but uh, once the shock wore off, um, my concern was to rush to the district and get the word out about the real medical issues there. I'll tell you that, um, to give you a sense of how misinformed people are and in, in a couple cases people on the scene neighbors wouldn't even shake my hand oh, wow. because of fear that somehow fear. I could be contaminated mm. um, clearly there's no scientific reason to think that just because I'm the councilman I would uh, be infected but this is what we're working against uh, we're making progress but a lot more education to do. Glad you're here to, to help spread that message. Dr. Debbie I wanted to get your take we, we got great news today about Nina Fahm also really yes. great news about Amber Vincent of course those two nurses who were infected there at Texas 
his health. Do you have any sense of what we could attribute their quick recovery to? Well, it's hard to know because there's the virus itself and then there's the person that it infects, right? So their immune system, their ability to fight the virus could be different. It could be different person to person. Of course, if someone's sicker or weaker, you know, if their immune system may not be able to mount the same response. And of course, I mean, here, the mortality rate is a lot better than it has been in West Africa, but I think the real risk is with healthcare workers. You know, we're doing a lot more advanced procedures, coming into contact with a lot more bodily fluids with the blood draws, the dialysis, the IVs. So that's something that we really need to focus on a lot more closely. Such a great point. All right, New York Councilman Mark Levine and Dr. Debbie Numpia Parample, thank you both so much. I really appreciate Thanks. it.